Hello folks, old Buster coming to you again. Got another little story for you. It's going to tell you if any of these folks uh, that you know you like a place that uh, you think need to be mentioned or you folks that listen to my stories would like me to mention you, well I'll be glad to. You just write me at Buster and the Boys at Yahoo.com and I'll be glad to do that. Pets. Knock, knock. Who's that door answered by? Ring, ring, ring. The telephone was answered by who? The one that really cares. The one that loves them. The one that accepts them as part of their family. This is the owner of a pet. They are always there if their pet is lost or hungry or sick. They anxiously await word if they do not return as expected. They miss them when they're away. Their heart is captured by the unconditional love of their pet and requite that love in like fashion. Boy, that's some fancy words, ain't it? Pets play an integral part in the lives of most people sometime in their lifetime. It is a life lesson. Well, Buster and the boys all had pets, several of them in some cases. Buster had Spike, his and Benji look alike stray, and Perry the parakeet, and Bob the black kitten with no tail. You know, Rat done ate it off when he was little. It's born. Jesse and Dundee, that's the family's black Scottish terrier, and Sparky and then Annabelle. That's an overweight chihuahua that just demanded constant attention, sitting in Jeffy's, Jesse's lap, wanting to be rubbed and petted. Walter had Smokey, his and gray horse that was a loyal a friend as any of the boys, and Ike, his and bloodhound, and Chico, the chihuahua. Of course, Ike's also his brother, too. Well, Hired had, well, an assortment of critters that stretched from infancy to old age. Brownie, his and German Shepherd, was special, though. Now, Hired let me tell you, that boy in Critters, you know, he'd catch them rattlesnakes and grab them by the hay and keep them in the refrigerator and play with them and oh lord, he could do any kind of critter. Well, let's start by telling about Buster, Buster's dog Spike. He was found by a friend of Buster's and was covered with ticks and cuckleburrs. Took a lot of doing to get that rascal cleaned up for sure. Well, Buster went to visit Jim at farm the family home place and Jim told Buster he had just a dog for him. Spike jumped into Buster's Ford and off they went back to Grandpa Gus and Grandma's house. Well, Spike settled right in and listened to Buster real good and minded well. He was as smart as a whip, that dog. Buster only let Spike in the house one time and that was after his and bath. Buster told Spike to lay on down there beside his chair and stay there or he'd put him out. The old Spike just looked up at Buster with them soulful eyes of his and twitched his and ears to acknowledge what Buster done told him. Now Spike had it real nice at the house now. He just couldn't wander around the main part of the house proper, but had what Buster called a convertible room. Buster built that whole thing for him. What it was was a, oh, I guess you could call it a one-car garage. Had heat and air conditioning and was carpeted and real nice. Dang dog would knock on the door every morning to wake up Buster. Well, after Spike got up and had a little bite, he'd make his and rounds of the neighborhood and the town. Cause England ain't very big, you know. He'd go and greet all the dogs on his and route and visit with folks that took to him and shook his and paw. Then Spike would come on back to the house for his and breakfast and be ready for the day with Buster. He went everywhere with Buster. When Buster went to town to a store, Spike would sit and wait outside till he come out. Some store, they let Spike come with him. He wouldn't do no business in there. He'd wait till he got outside. Well, everybody that passed by spoke to Spike and noticed Spike was Buster's dog. He got all manner of treats and attention from the whole town. When Buster would mow the grass <laughs> with his and riding lawnmower, Spike would sit up on the hood and ride till he was done a cutting. Spike would ride in the back of Buster's pickup truck, that Ford is, and bark a howdy to everybody that passed by. That dog learned real quick like now. Well, once when he was riding in the back of the truck, he jumped out too soon, got his and leash caught, and was being dragged along. <laughs> now Buster wasn't going very fast, and Spike was just low enough so his little legs was pedaling as fast as he could. He didn't get hurt none, but he never done that again, I tell you. Well, one day Buster was driving around a block trying to get Spike back in the truck, but Spike had his himself another notion. He was playing a game of chase with Buster. Well, Jimmy Joe, a friend of Buster's, was a roof in the house on that block and seen it all. 
Every time Buster went one way, Spike could go the other. He'd bark just a grinning from ear to ear, and them big old ears of his were just a flopping. Spike was quite the dog, you know. Now one time Larry, a Cherokee Indian friend of Buster's, brung an alligator snapper for Buster to see. Weighed in about 58 pounds, he said. Well, Spike wouldn't have none of it. Figured he was a protecting Buster. Barking and a raising cane when Buster got too close to that turtle, he figured. Spike was that way with youngins, too, a protecting them and all. Everybody loved that dog about as much as Buster, I tell you. When Jimmy Joe dropped off Bob, he took the caring for him, too. Him being <laughs> just a kitten and all. Dang rat done bit off Bob's tail when he was still a nursing. That's how come Buster come to call him Bob. Now Buster wasn't none too partial to cats, so he called Bob a hound, and darned if that cat didn't follow Buster around and mine just like Spike. When Buster fed Bob and told him to get on his in bed, he'd hop on in. Bob had a hole in an old weeping willow tree out back of the house and liked it a powerful lot. But he'd come on in and stay with Spike in the convertible room too. Both of them would huddle up together. They was fast friends, you know. Wasn't long ago till another showed up. It was Bob's litter mate, and he was wild as a March hare. Jimmy Joe done caught him up and dropped him off too at Buster's. That one would never get close except in the feeding time sometimes, and only if and Bob was there. Buster had a gal friend that left him with a darn bird too. A parakeet it was. Buster. <laughs> Told that bird he didn't like him none and want him around, but that darn bird just took the Buster. Buster called him Perry the Parakeet. One evening, Buster was eating some of them there atomic bomb fireballs that you get at Walmart. They was sweet and hotter than blazes. Well, Perry flew on over to Buster and gave him a kiss, a little peck on the lips, trying to get on Buster's good side. Well, now that dang bird got his itself a whale of surprise, that's for sure. See, them birds ain't got no saliva glands, and he had to get to water real quick since he got into something that hot. But the dangest thing happened, that darn bird come back for more. Reckon the sweetness got to him. Well, Perry liking them fireballs so much, Buster taught him a trick. Folks would look at Buster, and nothing but Perry's little legs would be sticking out of his mouth. Heck, they thought Buster done ate that bird whole, hide hair and all, and alive at that. Twerk so, and Perry just loved that trick. That bird could mimic any kind of sound. One night, Buster woke up to the TV of having channels changed. Twerk so, just Perry sounding like he was. When Buster went to bed, Perry would jump up on him and wouldn't let nobody or nothing come even close to Buster. You could look in on Buster asleep, and there would be Perry with one eye cocked open. And if you come too close, he'd go to picking and screeching to high heaven. When Buster went outside, Perry would stay lit on Buster's shoulder on the top of his and hate, wouldn't ever fly off unless Buster told him to, and then he would fly right on back to Buster. The Razorbacks was a playing a game one Saturday, and Perry done hear them calling the hogs and figured he could do that too. Well, Buster come in to see the game and hear them calling the hogs, but it wasn't the fans, it was Perry. He'd holler, Woo, pig, suey, Razorbacks, go hogs, go. Well, that evening, the newsman <laughs> says he had something for sure that was real unusual. There was a parrot that could say, Go Hogs, go, over in the next town. Well, Perry was a watching and told Buster to call that newsman because it ain't so that no parrot could outdo or talk him at all. Buster up and called the newsman told him to get on over to the house because he sure enough had a bird that could talk. When that newsman got there, Perry put on a show. Not only did he call the hogs, but he talked as long as they did. The newsman just couldn't believe his and ears and asked Buster if and he wasn't some kind of ventriloquist or using some other kind of trick. Buster says to him that he'd seen his for himself, and Perry took that kind of personal like saying he couldn't talk very good. Perry talked for near about two solid hours with that newsman just a gawking with his and mouth wide open where he'd catch flies. Now, that was a story for sure that the TV could show. Old Perry was famous. He didn't want no pay, just some more of them atomic fireballs from Sam's Club or Walmart. 
it's sad to say that all of Buster's pets passed on because they was family. The details ain't pleasant to talk about, but Buster knows the Lord has a place for them and reckons he'll see them again someday. Well, Al got Bob and his brother. A mean-spirited woman let Perry out and he froze to death. Some darn yahoos hit Spike in the head with their car bumper while he was playing with his ball next to Grandma's car. They got so close it was a wonder they didn't hit Grandma's car too. Now, if you didn't think Buster didn't go on a rampage, you got another thing coming. Buster put up a 4 by 8 sign in his yard telling everybody what he was going to do to them when he found out who done killed Spike. He thought more of that dog than he did them. They didn't even have the gumption to come tell Buster they hit him and just left him late. Buster was madder than a wet end, I tell you. It took more than a year till Buster took down that sign. Like I say, sad times. Hired has more pets than any one of the boys and most folks to boot. He had Brownie the German Shepherd, and he'd follow along with Hired when he rode his bicycle, and then when Hired took up his motorcycle riding. Brownie would run alongside of him too. Toughest dog you ever did see. Even bring in the paper in the mornings. Hired dearly love that dog, I tell you. Enough said. Walter has his in gray, and he is a fine one. But old Ike took the cake. That bloodhound would track through hell and high water. Ain't no telling what that dog would drag up neither. Now Chico was another matter. When old Barry Brown come a court in Marygale, Chico would run to the door just to bark it. Don't think he liked Barry coming around after Marygale because he had him a habit of biting the toe, toes of the feller's boots. Walter didn't like nobody sparking his and sister neither. Now, Barry always had on a pair of new boots or ones that was spit shine to a T. Walter would open that door and sick old Chico on Barry every time he'd come around. You know what a trickster Walter is. Said he right enjoyed it too. <laughs> well, Chico would head for the toe of them boots every time. Said old Barry to sail many a time, lighting a shuck off on that porch. Of course, all the boys would hoop and holler something fierce since they didn't cotton to no feller court in Marygate. Speaking of fellers a courting a sister of theirs, Gary Ashton was out on the town with Walter's brother Ike one time when Ike got his himself into a scuffle. Well, here Ike was a fighting like a bandy rooster and Gary was just a watching the fight. Well, back then Gary was about as stout as a bull. Whilst he was a watching Ike fight and all, he had a feller in a haylock like it weren't nothing at all. Feller wasn't even a twitching or squirming, Gary had him locked down so tight. He was the dang stout just couldn't get it loose. Well, Ike went on up to Amarillo to a bar one night for a little fun and entertainment and dancing. Now, all them Hollingers was dancing fools, you know. Walter Dunn went to and to keep him company. Whilst they sat there, a gal from a bank was over here talking about Ike. Said he done bought a ring and how much it cost and was going to ask Stella to marry up with him. Well, now, Ike was fit to be tied over that. Heck fire, he just bought the thing and ain't even asked Stella to marry him yet. Here they was at the bar and people are knowing more about his and business than he did. Now, Ike wasn't none too happy about that. Them a gossiping about him, I tell you. Now them Islanders got more stories than all true. Them, they got more stories than Carter had level little pills, little liver pills, I tell you. Now Jesse, now this story make a feller cry. Just dang near hate to tell it, but this is what life is about. Jesse had a hound or two in his time, but one in particular comes to mind. But first off, you just got to know, for some reason, them chihuahuas were real popular back then. Well, Jesse's folks had Sparky till he seed his in better days, and to this day, growed up and all, has Annabelle. He done inherited that handful from his and daughter. Well, Jesse had three youngins when he growed up. That dog just don't know when or where to pee and Jesse steps in time to time so has to be real careful like up in the night. That dang dog wants Jesse to hold and pet her every minute she's in the house. Now Dundee was a Scottish Terrier and a family pet. That's Jesse's ball uh, dog and she took to that dog like it was her own child. When Jesse went off to a lawyer in school he done met up with a gal that made him leave one standing in the house. Now Jesse was a mess in them days, 
And most folks wouldn't ever know that about Jesse, him being so quiet and all. Jesse didn't say much. <clears throat> well, I had to excuse me there, Red folks. I thought I got paid to that order. Jesse would report for the radio station and even went down on the river to interview young folks attending their concerts, something like a Woodstock. Being summer and all, all them young folks were swimming in the river and sunbathing and having a high old time. The radio station put Jesse on a boat. And they'd drive up and he'd start asking them questions. Well, they come up on a bunch of gals and danged if and they weren't all naked like it. You believe that? Just a laughing and carrying on, Jesse seed the sights that day for sure. Heck fire, Jesse even done some modeling for some clothes outfit one time. Anyhow, I got off the subject and that's why I was changing pages. When Jesse brung that highfalutin gal to meet his and folks, Dundee, the Scottish Terrier, run out to meet her, and guess what? He done keeled over, deader than a mitral, and a nail hammer head, too. Quite the day, that's for sure. <laughs> Jesse says to this day he should have took that as a sign that that there woman's weren't meant for him. But what can he say? Love is blind. Just didn't work out. Now the wailing and the weeping and gnashing of teeth was something right pitiful as Jesse's ma dearly loved that dog. She told Jesse and his and Paul that Dundee might just had a fainting spell. Jesse and his and Paul found a special place to bury Dundee and his and ma desired for his final resting place. She got so discombobulated that Jesse and his and Paul had to go back up and dig up Dundee to make sure he was dead. Oh Lord, I, I laugh about it, but it wasn't nothing I laughed about to her. Then they had to rebury him. Well, I don't think Jesse's ma ever got over that dog and her being Christian and all. No, just like Buster, that the Lord had a special place for them critters. What I'm a saying here is the rite of passage for Jesse. When his and Paul was standing out on the back porch holding Sparky, he fell off and hit his and Hayd because he had an aneurysm. Jesse had to be the one to decide to take his and Paul off of life support, him being the only son and all. Before the months before that, he drove about two hours to the hospital every day to tend to his and Paul. Jesse made his in peace with his and Paul and then told the doctors to let him go. Jesse and his and Paul knowed he was going to a better place because he knowed Jesus. Jesse's Pa was a fine man, worked for the gas company, and so did his and uncles. Uncle Cecil to this day is trifled that Jesse didn't stay with them as a lawyer, but Jesse had his and own life to live. He lived it well. But as a youngin, one of the boys... Life was good. All the boys had many adventures to go on and exploring the world before they started their own families. Those will be stories in their self. This old Buster saying have a blessed day, blessed day, and hope y'all enjoy the stories. Talk to you later next week.